Okay, I think I'm recording. I'm gonna, just going to wait just a moment because I don't trust my software, but I think all is going. Uh, welcome to Material Science 794. I'm Glenn Dane. I'm the instructor for this, and this is a kind of a purpose-made course just to give high school teachers a little bit of extra content in material science and engineering, and this is something that we do that's uh, in uh, in collusion with the ASM Materials uh, F Education Foundation course that's, that's, that's also offered in the summer um, for a number of teachers and I think all of you have been been part of that. Um, <clears throat> first thing I want to call attention to is my contact info and uh, phone works well. It, it, uh, it's the best number for me there and, and also email works well and the third mode of communication I'll talk a little bit about is I'd like you to use the uh, discussion boards for the class as much as you can so that uh, the discussions can be public as, as much as we can. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is, is apologize for the slow start we've had with this. Um, technology uh, has changed a little bit for me and, and some small changes have really thrown me off. And right now, I'm sorry, I'm fumbling with the microphone. Um, and um, I think I've got this under control. We'll see. Uh, one of the things I really want to do is make sure everybody can can get the lectures, and that's really uh, still a, the the main part of the course is is going to be through lectures, and you can definitely get um, a decent grade just by participating, watching the lectures, and uh, answering some uh, so, some questions based on that. So let me go through um, what we're going to do in this this one. This is really kind of an introductory lecture, just to let you know a little something more about the genesis of this content, how the class is going to work, what the fundamentals of material science are, and then just sort of the expectations I have in uh, working with, with you all. Um, let me go through this and, and the points will become apparent. Uh, first of all, how the course will operate. This is all going to be done by distance. Um, I would be happy to see if we could get some sort of a like a, a, a party line or conference call or, or, or real live uh, WebEx type seminar if people would like to do that. If you don't want to, I, I want to do things first and foremost that don't waste your time and really do give you some some basic insight into uh, how material science and engineering works and give you some content that will be useful in your in your classroom. Oops. Uh, oops. Um, forget about that. Um, <clears throat> so um, of course we'll operate through Carmen. We'll go through that. In order to get credit, I think uh, it all depends on what grade you want. Everybody should be getting graduate credit for this. This gives uh, three quarter hours of semester, three quarters hour, three quarter hours of graduate credit, excuse me, or two semester hours are the same thing. Um, everything is done by points. So in order to get a good grade, the main thing you have to do is, is accumulate points. I'll go through that. And the other thing I want to do in this lecture is, is give you some indication of where you can get more information. More of this will come. And then you know, give you my definition of material science, which might be a little bit different than what you've got over the summer, but, uh, but shouldn't be, be terribly different. Um, and what we are going to do here is what I would call material science. I wouldn't call it materials engineering. Or materials technology really it's is really what we're going to focus on here is the science of materials and it's going to be at an elementary level but it really is going from applied chemistry to stuff that we use every day and uh, my department you'll see is material science and engineering and we're not going to use the engineering term here um, simply because we're not really doing engineering in anything here we're really just trying to understand the fundamental science and get the basics down and um, you know what what I do or teach as a discipline is really how you can engineer materials to get what you need out of them and you'll see that coming through through the lectures um, quite a bit I mean again not doing the engineering but at least understanding the principles um, <clears throat> so again this course is all about giving you content that you might find useful in your classrooms um, this is very much under development. We did a very rushed offering this summer, and um, and that worked okay. Uh, this is a beta of something we'd like to turn into more of a staple, and I think over time our department would like to get fairly engaged in working with high schools to try to develop 
useful high school content. And please, please, please direct me in giving you anything that is useful. Please put me to work. Use me as a resource. I feel I'm being paid to do that. So any questions you have, anything you'd like to delve into more depth on, um, my specialty is really in structural materials and really how you process materials to get good structural properties for things like lightweight automotive bodies or automotive brakes or high temperature materials. However, um, at the high school level, I, I think I can at least lend a little bit of insight to almost anything in material science. I've spent um, you know, my, my entire professional career in that, so I, I picked up quite a bit of little things along the way. Um, so acknowledgments and notes, as, as you know, everything we're doing here is really based on the work that's been going on over about the last 20 years from the ASM Education Foundation. Um, all of this got started up in the Pacific Northwest at Pacific Northwest National Lab, and uh, engineers up there put together a laboratory manual that could be used in high schools. From that, the material uh, morphed and, and went a little bit viral. Uh, there have been a number of teachers that have been really influential in making that stuff go viral. Um, at, the, at the foundation level, it's been really Andy Nightham and Debbie Goodwin have been two teachers that are, are the kind of the, the primary master teachers that have developed a lot of the content and disseminated it to many people, and many of those people have picked it up. And I think it's really an interesting model of diffusion of, of knowledge of how this has happened. It's all been grassroots uh, because the content is so good and so compelling, and I've seen it at work in my local high school, my, my two of my kids who are now uh, engineering students took the course at Upper Arlington High School and they, they really liked the content. I could see it was very influential in, in uh, my kids doing what they do. Um, local colleagues, um, what I'm doing with this is I'm really building off of a course that we teach, Material Science and Engineering 205 which is the introductory course in materials science that almost all uh, of our engineering students take. All mechanical engineers take this, for example, and we're going to take that and build on it. Um, the Honda Partnership, Honda Ohio State Partnership Program is also important. They are subsidizing half the cost to, in order to get this to $270, $275 for three quarter hours. Um, Honda Partnership is taking the bare bone minimum and kicking in half of that. Um, university doesn't like us giving credit too cheaply. It kind of can undercut our model, so we're doing this as really radically inexpensively. And then um, the last guy that did a course like this was Tom Stobie up at uh, Washington State University, and we've had many conversations over the years and as, as this was being set up, and um, I'm carrying on some of his best practices and, uh, and, and his insight has been hugely helpful to me. So if you see this, you probably have been through the Carmen system already. Um, if you log in to carmen.osu.edu, you should be able to log in. There's a password you need to get in. And then along this, you'll see uh, something that looks like this. And there's a number of tools up in the bar include course home, content, discussions, Dropbox, quizzes, and grades. We will be using all of those. Um, home is what comes up. Content is where these lectures will be sitting. And if you are watching this lecture, it means you've got the content already. Um, discussion is the next one. And rather than using just one off email, really there's very little that is going to then be private between any of us. And I just assume any comments and so forth go up onto the discussion board. And with that, uh, what we can do is uh, have broad discussions about technical topics, what might be working in your high school, what demos work, what you might like further uh, explanation of. Um, Almost all the lectures that we do are going to be done uh, from scratch, more or less from scratch, for using content we have, but re-recorded. I'm happy to add uh, demonstrations to this. I'm happy to add other content, answer questions in this. Um, we can do things like I can record things on a webcam 
And so I could even do physical demos if there's anything that we need or, or walk it around the lab, take some movies in the lab if you're interested in what goes on at Ohio State. So please use this discussion area to, to, to bring up anything that, 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 that might be of interest to you. Um, Dropbox is where you can submit assignments to me. So always what you can do is you can make a, a PDF document uh, and almost any scanner now will allow you to turn something to a PDF. You can put that into the Dropbox. That's one of the ways you'll get credit. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, as I say in the content are the lectures and the primary way we'll get content is taking the lectures then answering questions on quizzes and the quizzes will be worth a certain amount each and if you can just keep plugging along at the quizzes you'll, you'll be able to do pretty well at the course and then uh, grades are shown here and that'll be kept fairly up to date I, I will try to do so that's basically the way we're going to, to run things um, so again communication group communication is highly encouraged again rather than sending me an email please use the Carmen discussion tool as much as you can. There's already been uh, one or two messages on it already. I think everybody's off to a little bit of a slow start. No, no problem. But I would like to keep everybody more or less together because I think that's going to give a, a far more uh, useful experience for all of us. And if you do send anything to me, um, what I would prefer, if you could, is, is, is put the tag 794, so just a square bracket, 794 closed bracket put that anywhere in the subject line and then that'll put that into one folder where all the 794 stuff happens um, I get too much email and sometimes I struggle with it and if something lapses more than 48 hours in my box and should be acted on and isn't uh, sorry to say it sometimes things get lost that way if you do this that will allow me to sweep everything up a couple times over the quarter make sure I deal with any 794 issues so please please put that in the subject line it's not mandatory but it will help me and it'll help me serve you better um, okay so here's the way the grades work the term of the class started January 3rd the end of the class is March 9th and that's the end of our our, our lecture period there's actually a, a finals week that happens after that also and I'd like to close this off by March 9th um, grading is the following um, you can get a, uh, a C is four, 40 points or greater a B is 60 to 80 points and A is over 80 points and points can be accumulated a number of ways um, probably the easiest way to do it is I promise I will put up uh, at least 10 lectures and you can get six points for watching the lecture and answering the quiz questions that go with it and um, and so with that you can get a B just by doing quizzes uh, to get an A there should be a mix of some quizzes and some sort of a project uh, a project is ideally something you would do with your uh, your students so in, in your class um, I, I, I know at least one of the teachers is not doesn't have regular classes as a, as a, a substitute and if there's anything you can do that you can show you've done something with with students in general that, that might be useful or others have um, I'm willing to be very very flexible with all of this um, please make proposals if you like and um, again my I want to give everybody good grades also um, I, I can't give just as a just bit of explanation I can't give grades based on the fact that you just went to an ASM camp that's something that my university won't let me do I have to give university credit only for something that was done in my class um, but uh, I can be fairly liberal on that I know you all have worked hard over the summer and uh, we do want to do our best to recognize the, uh, that with graduate credit but I also want to give you something hopefully that's of value to you so uh, please feel free to hold my feet to the fire with that too so again quizzes um, six points each they're gonna be all or nothing based on the mastery concept that is if you can show you're doing pretty well you know the content fairly well you get all the points so it's either a zero or a six 
and um, most quizzes will be multiple choice and 75% represents mastery and there will be multiple attempts allowed. And the quizzes are largely done, um, I'm setting them up so that these things can be auto graded and, and, and they go right into your uh, right into your grades if you if you get them if you get them right. So that's uh, efficient and uh, hopefully works well on your end as well. <clears throat> Projects, um, I'm open to suggestion with this. The initial model is two flavors of projects, 25 point, 45 point projects. Basically, a 25 is give me a lesson plan, show me uh, some example student work, and give me some sort of a report on what worked and what didn't. That's worth 25 points. Um, I know that uh, at least a couple of you are teaching full out material science courses in your high schools. For those of you doing that, um, I would recommend that you do a 45 point project and uh, that would show some extensive use of the curriculum. I'd like to have you know something like this for three lessons and this doesn't need to be onerous. It really can be uh, something that you do almost internally for your own evaluation. Put it up and, uh, and I, I will grade this. And if you have other ideas, something else you might like to develop, um, I'm more than happy, happy to uh, give the group credit for that. Um, what I really want to do with this is use this as a, a vehicle where we can kind of collaboratively develop content that could even be used to take the course forward. So what we can do is uh, work on some of these things. If anything good is developed, post it on the web, put it up on the site that ASM has and uh, use that to, to forward the cause and hopefully this will be used in other classrooms, be improved on, reported back on and uh, what I'd love to see is some years from now there's really a community of material science teachers that uh, develop their own content, uh, do this without, without uh, the textbook companies involved and in keeping all the content uh, up, for, uh, up for public dissemination. Sorry if I'm making noise on the uh, microphone. I've got a little earpiece thing that has a mic microphone. It's the first time I've used it. It's not, not very comfortable. Um, other potential gradable items. If you put a lot of discussions up in Carmen, I can give you credit for that. If, if, there's, if there's some number of you that really get into discussions and, and turn that into something useful, I'm happy to do, to do that. Um, the other thing I'm happy to do is I'm happy to have uh, sort of uh, WebEx sorts of meetings, little uh, web seminars, and we can do that through WebEx uh, and have group discussions with that. There's also uh, a Hangout tool in Google Plus where we can get a whole bunch of people sort of on one conversation and have sort of a virtual conference, uh, virtual discussion of many people. I'd be happy to do that. Um, just suggested I don't want to do anything that's onerous on you all, but but again, it's uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to very happy to do that. Okay, so th th this represents sort of the change in, in this lecture. What I want to change from is uh, the course mechanics to sort of a, a what is material science and what do material science uh, what material scientists and engineers make. And we'll just start here and go around. Um, Materials is really the basis of almost all engineering stuff and designers can only design what the material properties allow. And so for example, just starting here, um, power generation, I think you all have probably heard of uh, something called the Carnot cycle which basically says that uh, there's, there's thermodynamic limits on how efficiently you can turn, for example, uh, thermal energy, burning fuel, into mechanical work and mechanical energy. And basically the bigger the temperature difference between the high temperature and the low temperature is the more efficient the process can possibly be. So one of the, the tricks is by going hotter with the hot side of the cycle, um, but materials start to burn up and melt and, and, all, and get weaker and all these other things. So materials and power generation are, are really closely coupled and that's you know in, in the aircraft engine business and in, in the land turbines that make most of our electricity um, the, the, these are big big important problems with both environmental and economic consequences 
more modern stuff or more um, uh, interesting problems are our fuel cells and batteries. Um, materials are central to those, the, the, the surfaces that uh, collect electrons and so forth and uh, do catalytic things and fuel cells are really important. Um, this all gets into renewable energy and, and so forth. Um, computer chips are also highly material based largely on silicon. We dope those things with things like phosphorus and boron, etc. We can make electrons and we can make absence of electrons in the conduction gap called holes. Those make up these structures. We make the structures the right way and put the right electrical bias on them and so forth. We make all kinds of devices. This is all done at the sort of the nanometer scale. Very important area in technology, economics, and society and so forth. Um, recreation, things like um, uh, helmets, pads, and so forth have to absorb energy. So if a helmet gets dinged, uh, what you basically want to do is have this helmet deform rather than have your head deform is the way we, we end up keeping you safe. Um, the same kind of thing goes on with body armor. This is what our troops wear to keep them safe. It basically uh, absorbs the energy of a bullet flying at you. Um, materials are huge in biomedical implants. If you look, at, if you have to have a new knee at any place, what you typically have is a polyethylene cup, very high density polyethylene cup, and then cobalt chrome ball that fits into that. It makes a very good wear couple. It has very low coefficient of thermal expansion. It does wear a little bit, creates a little bit of wear debris. That's sort of a problem. Um, also at Ohio State, we have a few people working on artificial tissue. Jane Jun Guan uh, works on uh, artificial cardiac material. Heather Powell works on artificial skin, both very important issues. Um, environmental recycling, how we can get value out of garbage, is really a very modern day and important materials problem. Uh, making materials so there is less uh, impact by them is important. And the principles of material science also can be applied to food processing. Very, very interesting area, but it goes back to the same basic issues that we talk about, whereas the structure of something leads to its properties. We'll see that's really the basis of material science. And um, that can be brought to bear in, in, in food as well as materials. And I've also mentioned uh, you know, vehicles. Uh, of all types, automotive, aerospace. Um, materials are huge in the engines. If we can make them go hotter and make them so that they do not uh, uh, have, have high high strength and they don't uh, don't melt, don't creep, don't wear, that's a big deal. Frames need to be strong and stiff. And making lightweight frames for and flame frames and structures for cars and airplanes and all that is a big deal. And there's an amazing amount to this in terms of keeping things from corroding, getting the joining procedures proper, getting the forming procedures proper, not screwing up properties when you're doing any of this. Keeps many, many, many engineers properly employed, gainfully employed. And they're great, interesting technical questions in all of that. So really, materials enables all products from ice cream to airplanes. And that really is a, a, a true fact. So we can see material science in a couple different ways. And if you talk to people in the business, you'll hear very different, um, very different definitions of the field. A few different ways you can look at this is material classes. Um, I consider myself primarily a metallurgist. I also know something about ceramics, and composites, not, not quite as much about polymers. But that's one way of thinking about it is de defining yourself by the class of materials you work in. Another way to do things is by functions, and my interests are mostly in structural materials, meaning I care about how strong they are, how durable they are, if you can get a crack in them easily, and uh, if, if the crack happens, what, uh, how, how, how fast it might move, and so forth. Other things that people might be interested in, I mentioned like computer chips, electronic and optical is a big deal. Um, Lots of engineers interested in that. I have many students who uh, graduated from Ohio State and now work at places like Intel. It's a, a big um, 
application of materials in, in those fields. Functional is kind of close to this, but you know, sensing materials, actuating materials are materials that are called piezoelectrics. For example, if you take a material and this is your material, you put a battery on this, you'll get the material to actually extend in one direction, possibly, and shrink in another direction. And that's called a piezoelectric effect. You can use that as an actuator. Shape memory materials can kind of act as actuators. Um, this is all done very simply without a motor or anything. Catalytic materials can be important. It has to do with surface properties primarily. Again, there's lots of links between material science, chemistry, physics, mechanical engineering, and so forth. It's a great integrating discipline. And let's see. But the, the other way to see things is by the broad discipline of what material science and engineering is. And I'll hit this a few times. Is the idea that we can take a material, process it, that processing gives us some kind of structure. And in the lectures that we'll do here, I'll spend at least one entire lecture just talking about the structure of materials. It's really fascinating and, and very broad topic. And structure then leads to properties. And so, you know, the, the, the structure is really what is very unique to material science and binds this all together. And we will talk about length scales in some depth also as this, as this set of lectures goes on. But but to a chemist, sort of the way we might see structure is, for example, polyethylene. You've got carbon chains, and you've got hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen coming off here. And chemically, that's what, what polyethylene is. And depending, and, and, and really, the, the chemistry doesn't change very much. You have very specific bond angles here and so forth. And this, these bonds have particular stiffness associated with them and so forth. And that's sort of where I think the chemists tend to leave off. Where the material scientists come in is it's really how do these, these long chains interact with one another and how do we make structures out of these chains. So it's really taking those building blocks. So imagine these are ropes and weaving those ropes into something else, a higher level structure. Um, and that's, that's what, what we in the materials discipline really care about is higher length scales than this, but shorter length scales than like mechanical engineers care about. We don't care about the whole bridge, but the stuff that makes it. So the idea is you have processing structure properties. That gives you a material. And that leads to performance. And you'll see that displayed a little bit differently in, uh, in another slide or two. So again, one of the ways you can define this is based on materials classes. The primary materials classes we start with really are metals, ceramics, polymers, and then one that's derived from that is composites, which would be mixing these materials classes together. Low-tech examples of all these things. For metals, we might think of a low-tech thing as being a, a beverage can. In ceramics, you might think of whitewares or something you'd uh, sit on in the bathroom as being a, a low-tech example of a ceramic. And in polymers, you might think of a, the, the bag you carry your groceries in, which is usually polyethylene, uh, as being, a, a, again, a fairly low-tech example. There's also much higher tech examples. Um, you can take something that's chemically very similar to this Coke can, build an entire aircraft. There's also all kinds of metals within uh, the engines here. But you really need very high strength to do this. Joining technology, corrosion control technology, lots of engineering in something like a, a troop transport plane. Um, going on to ceramics, again, something very chemically similar to what you'd use in your kitchen is the thermal control surface on um, uh, this this is maybe a little dark but this is a space shuttle the bottom of the space shuttle is coated with a very porous ceramic that's used as a heat shield um, that is a highly engineered material that is glowing red hot on one side and obviously on the other side you keep the, the crew cool in polymers um, again sticking with about the same chemistry this is polyethylene. Um, this is a bulletproof vest. The, the material that's usually used in bulletproof vests is something that's commercially called 
Dyneema or Spectra. And these are fibers that are simply polyethylene again. But the key to this is what you've done is you've taken those carbon backbones and you've got them all aligned in fibers. So you've got these long fibers and the carbon backbones are all lining along the directions of the fibers and these are very strong covalent bonds for those of you who are chemists. Those very strong covalent bonds can give you very, very strong, very, very stiff fibers. And if you get the structure right, um, you can basically stop bullets with the same material that goes into a trash bag. And it's all about the engineering of the material. Really a great, great success for our field. So this is the way we look at our discipline again, the overall goals. We want to be able to make things that are value, people use, people get value out of. And um, questions we really are interested in addressing over this class, material science and engineering, or what are the properties of different classes of materials, how those properties depend on structure, and then how can we change the structure and therefore the properties of the material based on, based on processing. Um, I'm going to turn the phone call off. I'll get back to that in a bit. And so th this is um, what's often called the materials performance tetrahedron. Four vertices on this processing leads to structure, leads to properties, leads to performance. So you'll often see people put those together into a sort of a tetrahedral structure. To me, it's more of a linear thing where I think processing gives you structure, that gives you properties, that gives you performance. So I see it more as a linear than, than this um, more equal tetrahedron. But uh, you, you, you'll see that, and I think that's something that came out of Northwestern University, and it was uh, Maury Fine and colleagues back there back in the early 1960s that kind of defined this topic of material science and came up with this tetrahedron and um, it's, it's taken off uh, very successfully other places. It recognizes that this is a core discipline to all these classes of materials, be they metals, ceramics, and that's why pre the 70s you would hear about people identifying themselves primarily as metallurgists, ceramists, polymer engineers, and so forth. And these days, we pretty much all see ourselves as material scientists who work in this paradigm and uh, can apply this trade to almost anything. So again, now, now getting to this idea of applying this trade um, various places. Um, this is again uh, steel, and this might be, uh, in looking at this, this looks like this is something that is about what, what we call commercially 1070 steel and uh, I'm going to try to pause this thing if I can. Um, hold on just a second. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep keep on soldiering on. I'm sorry. Oh, I hope I didn't screw this up. Um, so, so what you have is this is a steel, and it's 1070 steel means this is iron plus about 0.7% uh, carbon, and steel is primarily an alloy of iron and carbon. And here what you see is, is hardness, a property plotted as a function of cooling rate. This is how you do the process, and you can see the structure inset here. And again, this is all at the same chemistry, and if you cool very slowly, you get a structure like this, where this is iron carbide and iron, and these are, these are little iron carbide spheroids. If you cool more quickly, the carbon isn't able to diffuse into these little spheroidal things, and you end up, this is what we'd call a prolytic structure. 
you don't have to know these vocabulary words. Prolytic structure. And this is what we call a spheroidal structure. Spheroidal. And you can see this is about the same magnification. And, and we materials people usually work at very high magnifications. Um, if you cool more slowly, you can get something like this. This is a bainitic structure. You can see this is much higher magnification. You get much smaller little pieces of carbide. Again, this is iron and iron carbide. And if you cool very fast, the carbon doesn't have time, and we can talk about iron carbon metallurgy later, possibly, if, if you all like. Um, the carbon doesn't have time to diffuse into these uh, into these carbides, and you have these laths and the laths, and this is something we call martensite which is very hard, very strong, somewhat brittle. Um, and uh, you can see you're getting much higher hardness. You're getting about a six-fold increase in hardness. So you're changing the structure all simply by very simple changes in the process. And it's basically from going from a high temperature phase to a low temperature phase very quickly causes significant changes. So again, here's a tensile strength. So, so the, let me start with the other one. So, so imagine let's do this somewhat differently. In this case, we're going to deal with what are predominantly single phase alloys. Here you see these are multi-phase alloys, two phases, the two phases usually being iron carbide and iron. Here what we're doing is single phase materials and we're just introducing defects in the crystals called dislocations. And these dislocations you can put in by cold working the material. I think you've all done this in camp. And as you cold work material, you see the strength goes up dramatically. Ductility, the amount you can stretch it before it fails, goes down dramatically. And um, and, and if anyone likes, let me know. I can um, put uh, some uh, movies up. And uh, hold on, let me just. Hello. Hey, Katie. Hey, I'm I'm recording a lecture right now. Just can I? Call you back in like ten minutes. Yeah, Is that everything good? Yeah. Okay, okay. Let, let me do that. Hold on. Let me finish what I'm at, up to, and then I'll I'll call you soon. Thanks. Bye. Right. Okay. Excuse me. I uh, getting multiple call well, multiple calls from the same person, and just wanted to. Um, don't know how to pause this thing and I'd probably screw up the whole thing if I did, so, so sorry about that. So, so anyway, what we can do is we can cold work material. As we cold work material, strength goes up, ductility goes down, and that's because we're putting all these dislocations into the material. And what we can do is then anneal these single phase materials and pull the dislocations back out and reverse that trend. So again, as you increase the, the annealing temperature, the strength goes back down, ductility goes back up. And again, you're getting back to more of an annealed structure, and you can go back and forth. It's all manipulating, manipulating a process to give you uh, structure that gives you properties. So um, that's basically what we do. We can apply that to anything. And I will um, uh, give you several examples of this as we go. And uh, what I want to talk next about is why we might use material science in a high school environment. And the uh, basic reason is it starts with applied chemistry. So it really it's naturally there anyway. And it really shows, I think, how science leads to products. And I think this can be a really strong motivator for kids. I think often the way we do science, uh, particularly at the university level, I think you guys at the high school level are better than us, is we teach it in a really abstract way kids have almost no idea why they're learning what they're learning and I know loads of people that have interesting careers in this and they're not really doing science at all the way it's taught in high school but it really is much more goal focused into making cool products and I think this curriculum can really show this off. It also integrates science, technology, engineering, and math. You get the whole STEM, um, all, all four elements right there. Um, plenty of ways we can put math into this, plenty of ways we can show technology out of this. And the other thing that's nice is, is the people that have been involved with this have all been really doing this through low-cost demos, things you can get from almost anywhere. 
and there really is good content in it even though it's, it's low cost and the content works and motivates and plenty of examples I've seen this done several times my kids other places uh, I think a lot of you know Andy Knightum um, he teaches material science uh, every period of the day and uh, it's been estimated by the folks at Washington State that about 1% of the nation's material science uh, material science professionals nationwide have taken one of his courses. He's been very productive in getting people into this discipline. They go from his high school uh, into, into material science in college and then into grad school. And we've had some of Andy's students at Ohio State. And uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, just showing them at that age that there are good options for them. Um, we've had several people from uh, Beth Eddy's classroom in Westerville South We've also now gone into material science, been part of the materials camps for students and at our place at Ohio State. And um, other great, great teachers tend to tend to like this content and are doing great things with it also. Um, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of all this, uh, this all pretty much comes out of the Pacific Northwest Patel uh, PNNL. Uh, this is all kind of built in a, in a viral way from there. And there have been these uh, great low-cost experiments that have happened, things like glass-forming, slip-casting, things in laminated composites, making stuff, making solders, making nylon. Um, and uh, this is started here, but, you know, it's been the energy of loads of people. And, and, uh, and again, uh, Andy and Nightum and Debbie Goodwin have been, uh, I think, the most prolific among them, but others have contributed to that. And I would love to see a, a culture develop where there's a culture of sharing among among uh, high school teachers and uh, folks like me, I think are very, many people like me would be very happy to make sure the contents on on target and and give advice and review things. Uh, but uh, you all know better what would would work well in a high school environment than than I would. Um, so anyway, what's in the course right now? I think you've all seen the content. Uh, many many topics and example activities um, and this is all in the the ASM content just looking at metals you know I've got lost wax casting can be done phase diagrams you've probably done the uh, bismuth tin alloys on hot plates um, I'll do some stuff on historical importance of metals and there's activities that all all go with with all of this and again it's great content where you are doing real teaching teaching that has scientific principles in there and also shows how those scientific principles turn into stuff that we uh, we care about. So uh, to give you some resources, um, there, there's some good, and, and it, something I will also try to do with this is put onto a little website some of the better resources, but ASM International has done a great job of pulling together a lot of the resources. Um, those I think you're aware of. We've done some of this a couple of years ago. Ohio State tried to pull some of this together. Cambridge and some other universities, Cambridge in particular, has a really nice compendium. Uh, it stands for, uh, uh, what is it, something like Demonstrations of uh, Information Technology for Material Science out of uh, Cambridge. A lot of stuff is there, examples of tensile testing, metallography, uh, casting, all this stuff. Uh, materials Education org at Evans Washington is another source for resources um, I, th I think almost the trick in all of this is culling the really good stuff from all the stuff that's out there and putting it all into a coherent package and um, I welcome help and advice on that and I'm willing to put put some time into that as well if, uh, if there's any direction on what, what what's what's needed um, if you want the, the, to go even deeper than this course uh, Peter Anderson, uh, another professor here at um, Ohio State who's done a lot to develop our introductory course, he's put one of his recent course offerings entirely online, shown there. Movies of his lectures, his, all his PowerPoints and everything are up. Um, you're welcome to, 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 to check that out. And then these are other resources that are really more... Uh, more generic than material science focused um, that I'm just putting up for completeness. And then the other thing that we're going to do, hopefully, let me know if you object, but if, if you do, I'll, I'll 
respect your wishes, but anything that you turn in for assignments, I would like to be able to use and turn back to the greater community. Um, I will recognize that it comes from you and your students, um, but we're not going to uh, make any money out of it. And I think that that ethic is a, is a good one where uh, it's kind of a share and share alike and uh, acknowledge what's done. And there is something beyond copyrights. This is something called Creative Commons. That really kind of is trying to push this that push this ethic, where what you do is you try to attribute, i.e., uh, acknowledge where content came from, who did the work, and then there's also this thing called share alike. If you go to CreativeCommons.org, you can see this, um, and and so th this is the way I tend to want to publish this sort of thing where. You, people agree that they try to do their best to attribute who came up with the concept of the work behind things. And then uh, people can use that, build upon it, share alike, improve it, put it back into the system, and have this whole system move forward. And that's uh, uh, generally the ethic I'd love to see going forward with all of this. So the next step, um, please do the quiz. Uh, there's quiz one that's up there. Um, basically, it's just asking you uh, who you are, where you came from, what you want to get out of this course, what you might like to do for, for an assignment. Um, please do that. Ask any questions if you like. The discussion board is the best forum for that. And then something that isn't in the first assignment, but I'm going to make part of the second assignment, is please use the discussion board and introduce yourself to the rest of the class. Just put up a little note of who you are, where you teach, what you're doing with material science, anything else that's relevant or fun. And again, e even though this is kind of a distant, you know, distant group, there's uh, about, I think, 18 of us um, and uh, spread about in this offering, I would like to get us uh, kind of uh, discussing and, and trading ideas and so forth. And I'm going to make this a part of the part of the requirement for, for quiz two. Um, that's all I've got right now. The next lecture that I hope to record very soon is really uh, basically has to do with the history of material science and how material science fits into the broader scope of, of engineering. Um, again, please uh, ask any questions you like, and uh, uh, please feel free to uh, put me to work to, to provide things that, that you'd find useful. Um, that's it, and I... Uh, Appreciate you all being part of this and look forward to, to working with you through the, this quarter. I'm going to end things there, I hope.